Good morning. It's now the top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for the MFL, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session. Whether you're joining us in our interactive webinar platform here in APAN or in our YouTube stream, or perhaps viewing a recorded session, we're thrilled that you're here. Today's session, Culinary Medicine, where health meets food, is hosted by the Nutrition and Wellness Concentration Area of the MFLN. Throughout today's session, we hope that you'll join us in conversation via the chat pod in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Thank you to those of you who have taken the time to introduce yourselves. This chat window is also available for you if you wish to ask questions of our presenter today, as well as chime in with your expertise and experience. Also note in the lower right-hand corner, the event information pod, the militaryfamilieslearningnetwork.org link that's located there will connect you with webinar slides, handouts, and other event materials available in support of today's webinar. Additionally, if you need tech support at any time, uh, simply just shoot us an email at the MFLN email address that's also located in that window. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD USDA partnership for military families, and our passion is to, to connect military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research and to each other through innovative online programming. I'll now turn the mic over to Robin Allen, who is the program coordinator for the MFLN Nutrition and Wellness Team, to introduce today's topic as well as our presenter. Robin? Thank you, Coral. My, as Coral said, my name is Robin Allen, and I'm the program coordinator for the MFLN Nutrition and Wellness Concentration Area. Today, I am very excited to introduce our speaker, Leah Saris, registered dietitian. Leah is the director of operations, executive chef, Goldring Center for Culinary Medicine at the Tulane University School of Medicine. Leah is a chef and dietitian that has worked in diverse areas of food service and related industries, including restaurants, academia, research and development, food service consulting, uh, farming and community outreach. As the Director of Operations and Executive Chef for the Gold Ring Center for Culinary Medicine, she has developed and implemented the United States' premier inter interdisciplinary program between culinary arts, science, nutrition, and medicine based out of New Orleans. She teaches professionals in the healthcare and food service sectors as well as the community at large how to cook food that is affordable, beautiful, healthy, easy to prepare, and most of all, delicious. This program is the first of its kind and has been licensed by over 20% of the medical schools in the nation. Leah's passion lies in teaching everyone how to make delicious food that just happens to be good for them, arming people with the knowledge and skills that bring vision into their kitchens. Her research interests are vitamin B12 and vegetarian diets. I will now turn this over to Leah. Good morning, and thank you so very much for the introduction. I'm really happy to be with you all this morning. Um, I'm super excited that we have such a varied audience. I'm seeing some uh, familiar places and some people that might be using some of our courseware, so I'm, I'm interested to definitely hear more from you all here as well, and thank you for the great introduction, Robin. I'm going to start with a little bit of a background forward here. Now, I know we have a lot of RDs um, on this uh, webinar, but some of you may not be, so I'm sure most of you have probably seen this slide before, so I'll probably jump through some of those types of things, uh, but since we have a varied audience, I like to touch on it. Um, this is a map from the CDC showing the prevalence of obesity and diabetes in the U.S., and to me, I think this is a really good representation of why we're here talking about food. On the top, we can see that obesity has increased by over 20% in just about 20 years, while diabetes has increased over 10% in just about 20 years. And I think that makes it really evident that this is lifestyle-oriented and not necessarily um, just related to, to genes or uh, changing body types. So to me, this is a great indicator that we really need to delve into lifestyle change in order to uh, help approach some um, some solutions to our issues with uh, disease related to our food intake. Again, this is from the CDC. This shows the top 10 causes of death. I've highlighted the ones in red that we know are very, very closely correlated with diet. Now, that's not to say things like Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot of great research coming um, out with uh, about food and neurocognition, for example, but 
things like heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease can very, very easily be prevented or treated with diet, and yet that conversation doesn't happen, as I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, in, in the clinic. We spend over $970 billion per year on preventable diseases. So for the people that the health piece may not be the motivator, I always think money may be a motivator for some people. So I think if we could just take a small portion of this $970 billion, almost $1 trillion, and put it towards the prevention and education of food, we might not have to spend so much. So culinary medicine is, is a newer term. A lot of people may not be familiar with it. You've probably started hearing it here and there. Um, but I often get asked, well, what is culinary medicine? So to me, um, culinary medicine is really about a, a science-based approach, evidence-based approach to uh, medicine and nutrition and seeing where they come together. However, it's really a food-first approach. You're going to hear me say that multiple times. Uh, as we often say to our practicing physicians or the medical students that we're teaching, you know, you're not telling patients to go to the grocery store to buy a bottle of fat and a box of carbohydrates and a pound of protein. You know, we're talking about olive oil and chicken and pasta. So we really need to talk in terms that the patients can understand and not get them uh, lost in the medical jargon. We do this through teaching hands-on cooking classes. We want our uh, people in our class to, to talk the talk and walk the walk and make realistic um, recommendations to the patients. This is a multidisciplinary approach, and I'll touch on this a little more later, but we think this is a great way to actually bring together the healthcare team and in no way are trying to turn physicians into dietitians. It's not their specialty. They don't have the time to do that. We don't want them to do that, but we do want them to be on our side and help to advocate for nutrition with patients. Again, I mentioned I'll mention that food first approach um, quite a bit. Uh, we don't want we don't want to, we want to make sure to talk to people in terms that they understand. And and just like any type of nutrition advice, we want to make sure that what we're telling patients is sustainable, and that we're not trying to tell them to overhaul their diets in any way that is unrealistic for them doing too much at once so we we reiterate over and over to do um, to give short simple messages and and to really just focus on one or two areas that they may be able to help influence the patient to make healthier choices in the long run and when we're talking about this we're not just talking about the food choices but also the barriers that go into those things like a uh, cooking skill uh, or some people just don't want to cook uh, cooking for one uh, not being able to make it to the grocery store in time, and obviously just not understanding what nutrition means. So we're really um, investigating the full gambit of everything that goes into making healthier choices. I'm going to jump in here with a little bit of a case study. This is an example of one of the ones that we do for, medical, for our medical students. I have another one later just to help break it up and give you an example of how we apply this. I'm going to ask you all a question at the end, and if, um, if you have any feedback, just uh, feel free to, to type it into your chat window, and I'll glance and see some of your feedback. So this is one of our case studies. This is based on a real patient with one of the physicians we work with. Uh, this is Mr. T. He's a 59-year-old African-American male. He's a bellman at a hotel here in New Orleans. He doesn't drive. Uh, he does take the bus. Um, he works about 45 hours per week. Uh, and he handles luggage a lot, being a, a bellman or doorman. Um, he says he works pretty hard. I'm sure moving around luggage all day isn't very easy, uh, and he's constantly up and on the move. He does have a family history of type 2 diabetes, um, and his mother died in her 70s, but he doesn't know why. His father also died pretty early and suddenly. He doesn't really smoke or drink too much. He, he does occasionally he'll have a cigar and occasionally have a beer with a football game doesn't really act, exercise actively. He, he's not married and he lives with his brother. He does have um, diabetes and hypertension. Uh, we can see from his past medical history, as I mentioned, he has type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. He is on some medications to help control those. Um, his review of systems, uh, really the only thing that's significant is he does get a little out of breath when walking more than six blocks. Um, his labs. His A1C is, isn't too bad. Uh, we've certainly seen a lot worse. It's 7.1. Um, his 
his lipids are a little high. His blood pressure is also high. Uh, obviously, we can see his weight, waist to hip ratio is an ideal, and he is um, he is pretty overweight. So this is the part where we talk about his diet. So this is uh, his 24-hour dietary recall. We do actually recommend to physicians that they have uh, do perform a 24-hour dietary recall with all their patients to get a better sense of what they're eating. You know, they're asking them from everything from um, their uh, drug use and family history and exercise patterns, but why aren't they focusing more uh, on diet? We think that should be part of the conversation every time. So uh, Mr. T's having waffles, syrup, sausage, and soda for breakfast. Uh, I will say his breakfast and lunch, he often eats at the hotel. They provide food for the staff, or he might stop at a restaurant or cafeteria on the way. He's having some donuts and punch for a snack. This guy really loves his punch and soda. You'll see going through this. For lunch, he's having um, meatloaf, mashed potatoes and gravy with green beans and soda. Again, that uh, is at the um, at work where they're providing them with a family meal, which often ha happens in hospitality. He has some more punch, uh, some bologna sandwiches on white bread for dinner, and um, some popcorn and punch for a snack. So. Uh, I'm sure you've had some patients like this if you're a dietitian or physician, um, but it's definitely not ideal. Uh, we can certainly see a lack of things like vegetables in his diet. So my question to you is, what when you're looking at his intake, what do you think is his biggest barrier to healthy eating, and what specific suggestions might you give to help him improve his diet? So I'm just going to scroll back. When you look at this, what is it that you think might be the issue? All right, so we'll mention sugary drinks. Absolutely. Yep, punch. See, that's the easy place to start, right? Uh, there we see it, ability to cook. And water, that's a good one. Yeah. So as we can see, y'all are right on point. This guy doesn't really know how to cook. I would, I would, when I'm looking at his diet, he's eating out all the time. He's making a sandwich uh, to, at home. He doesn't really know how to cook. And, you know, this is, this is interesting because a lot of times we'll bring this up to our medical students and sometimes they'll say things like, you know, have him roast a chicken or maybe he can make some quinoa. And so we have to take him back a few notches and really talk about re realistic approaches to his diet. So I see someone mentioned the low-hanging fruit, and, and a lot of people mentioned, uh, you know, sugary beverages, uh, lack of water. So I do agree that's a really great place to start with him is cutting back on the sugary beverages, and we might even do that in a step-by-step -step approach. I mean, right now he's drinking soda or punch one, two, three, four, five, six times a day which is pretty extravagant. I'm amazed his A1C is uh, as great as, is as good as it is considering, but probably because he's pretty active at his work. Um, and he's not necessarily overeating. It's, it's just uh, his choices. So reducing his processed and sugary beverages is going to be ideal. Um, now, a lot of times we'll talk about uh, going through his meals. So with the family meals, it does make it a little harder because he has to eat the food that is left for him. Um, and I don't really foresee him at least starting coming for lunch. So I might speak with him about, ask him what kind of choices are available, talk about doubling up on the vegetables, talk about whole muscle meat um, versus processed meat, so maybe like chicken versus a meatloaf. And uh, I think dinner might be a fairly easy thing to start approaching, just getting him to switch to whole wheat bread. Uh, maybe focusing on a different kind of meat, but you know, maybe we can't get him to go there yet. We can get him to add some lettuce and tomato to his sandwich. So again, we just want to do small, simple steps, realistic approaches. I'm not going to tell this guy to cook you know, a dinner that's going to take him hours to start with, and we have to meet him where he's at. All right, so let's just talk a little bit about the Mediterranean diet, which is the basis around most of what we teach at the Gold Ring Center. And I'm sure you're all familiar with it and have heard of it. And we're going to delve a little bit in more into the literature around the Mediterranean diet, which there's just, just hundreds and hundreds of studies on it, which is largely why uh, we, we teach it. Um, but I just want to introduce to some of it. This first study uh, was done by Antonia Tricopoulou in Greece on 22,000 people. It's one of the biggest and best studies to date, one of the earliest. 
uh, and they basically took these people's current diet as is and assigned it to a Mediterranean diet score of 0 to 9. So I'm going to go over what these 9 points are, but most Mediterranean diet studies do use a 9 point Mediterranean diet score. So 9 points would be mean you're reading, eating a really balanced diet and 0 would be akin to more like a McDonald's diet. Um, so we want to see people improve their Mediterranean diet score as much as possible. What we found from the study with Antonia Tricopoulou was that if people improved their Mediterranean diet score by just two points, say from a five to seven, they reduced their all-cause mortality and cancer by 25%. And I think this is really powerful and meaningful for us to recognize you don't have to make these huge sweeping changes in diet in order to make a very large impact. So we can start small and build from there. So just two points improvement. So we can find with our patients what those two points might be and start there. Okay, so we have uh, nine points of the Mediterranean diet score as, as I just mentioned. All of these are going to be very familiar to you and you're probably teaching them in various capacities. The first being vegetables. Uh, we all know the vegetables are really good for us. In the Mediterranean diet score, that equates to about 9 ounces per day for, per female and about 11 ounces per day for a male. It's really just based mostly on body weight. That's about 2 to 3 cups per day depending on um, the, the vegetable that you're eating. So uh, a lot of times the way I tell patients to incorporate and the way we do incorporate vegetables into our cooking classes are by showing people that they can incorporate vegetables into foods that they're already eating. So if they're making grains, cooking, adding veggies to the grains, adding vegetables to things like sandwiches, even sauteing them in the morning with your eggs, something as easy as a handful of spinach can be uh, a great addition for you. So again, when you talk about two to three cups, it can sound daunting for someone like Mr. T, who's really almost getting no vegetables in his diet. But if we can start talking to him about having a vegetable with every meal, and about how, how to make them flavorful so that he enjoys them, he's going to be much more likely to eat them. Next is legumes. We really love legumes, the med diet. I saw someone mention uh, legumes in their uh, comments. Our, that's kind of our, uh, we have actually written on our shirts during our conference, we love legumes because we love them so much. So um, legumes do include beans, lentils. Uh, I don't want to forget peanuts because I think things like peanut butter can be a really easy, great addition. Here in our picture, we have some red beans and rice, which here we really love. Uh, unfortunately, it's usually laden with a lot of pork fat. So a lot of what I talk about with our patients is how to turn that into a healthier version. We talk about things like adding smoked paprika to get the smoky flavor and cut down on the amount of pork that might be in it. You don't really need a ton of legumes. You only need about two ounces per day. That equates to about two and a half cups per week of legumes. And again, I tell people to think of creative ways to get them. A peanut butter and jelly sandwich is going to be a great option, especially compared. I'm not going to be as worried about that jelly, especially compared to some other options. It's better than cheeseburger, right? And we're getting legumes, and we could get some whole grains from bread. So that could be a really good option for some of our patients. There's other options for some people. Something like hummus might make sense. Uh, we do a lot of, we show people how to use legumes to thicken soups uh, and to thicken sauces. Uh, we've even done white bean dressing that's like a Caesar style dressing. So kind of almost hiding them into foods. I also show people how to add them into things like chilies and stews and things they might not otherwise, um, that things they might not otherwise ask. I just see a great question about peanut butter. Does it have to be natural or non-hydrogenated? So I do recommend to, pe to people that they get what is more the natural peanut butter. Usually I recommend Smucker's natural peanut butter uh, because that's widely available in almost every store I ever go to. Um, a lot of stores now you can grind your own peanut butter. That's a pretty good option too. Uh, but I do recommend the non-hydrogenated and, and peanut butter that doesn't have the sugar added in it. So there's a lot of, there is some options out there, but I think the Smucker's Natural is probably the easiest one. Next on the Mediterranean diet score are fruit and nuts. Most Mediterranean diet scores do pair fruit and nuts together for the antioxidative qualities. You actually don't need too much. You need about two to three servings per day in order to get a point. 
So I try to encourage people to always have a piece of fruit with breakfast and maybe have a palm full of nuts or another piece of fruit uh, for a meal. I also talk about incorporating them into things like salad. And especially for our sweet eaters, people like Mr. T, fruits could be fairly easy to incorporate into his diet because he obviously um, has a taste for sweet foods already. Next are cereals and whole grains. So um, I'm sure we all know that our diet is very high in carbohydrates, but the really what we want to do is translate those into healthier carbohydrates. So moving people more to whole grains. Now, I found one of the most valuable things about doing our hands-on cooking classes is helping um, show people that there are a lot of really great whole grain products out there. When they first started coming out in the market, you know, 10, 20 years ago, I'm sure a lot of you recall, whole, a lot of whole grain breads were really uh, cardboard tasting and flavorless and um, just not very appealing. So uh, really it's come a, a long way, especially things like whole grain pasta. And there's a lot of great alternative options that, that aren't necessarily wheat-based as well for people who might not be eating um, wheat or can't eat wheat. So uh, I like to get them to taste it. And a lot of people convert it just by actually trying it because they're afraid to buy it and waste their money. But if we can give it to them and they see that it's good, they're more willing to buy it. But just getting people to switch uh, to things like whole grain bread and whole wheat pasta is a really good option. We do start to in in introduce some new, more, more widely available um, grains like quinoa, which isn't really so unique anymore. You can find it on most shelves. Uh, we teach people how to cook rice, a simple skill that they, they may not have, brown rice especially. I feel like people might be a little more intimidated. It just takes a little more time and advanced planning. But otherwise, it's just as easy. Uh, to do. We do like to point out that pop, that corn and even popcorn is a whole grain and can be a good option. Uh, so making your own popcorn for a snack without all the butter and such can actually be a really good option, especially for our salty snackers. Fish and seafood, I'm sure you might have thought of that when you think of the Mediterranean diet. A lot of people think it's tons and tons of seafood. It's probably not as much as you think. You really only need about two servings a week to get a point on the Mediterranean diet score. So they, you know, they do still eat meat and animal proteins in Mediterranean-style countries, um, and they do eat a lot more seafood than us. Now, of course, fatty fish is the best, things like tuna, salmon, uh, that'll be higher in omega-3s, but really any seafood is, is good. I do try to get people to be a little more of aware, uh, be a little more aware of farm-based versus wild, especially things like tilapia, which because of what they're fed can be actually quite high and omega-6 fatty acids and too much omega-6, as you know, can be um, inflammatory. So again, I do try to tell people to focus on what's local and available. So here in New Orleans, that's not really salmon, as good, good as salmon is for us. Although I will say places like Costco and Walmart are making it more likely to be able to get things like salmon and tuna frozen that are decent quality. They're frozen at sea and much more affordable than they used to be. So. Uh, um, I, I do encourage people to try those if they're able, but for landlocked uh, cities that might be canned tuna might be the best option. You know, really most people can have that at least three times a week and not, not be an issue. Uh, someone asked about shrimp and crawfish. Well, actually that's what I was just about to say. Here, shrimp is an excellent option. Uh, shrimp is actually a, a pretty moderate amount of omega-3s. It's affordable here. It's fresh. So that's what I encourage people to eat quite a bit here. Crawfish is also really good. Um, but unfortunately, when it's prepared, it does have a lot of salt generally here, so I do have to watch that. Uh, we get a lot of people <laughs> who might have kidney disease and end up in the hospital after, you know, when it's crawfish season because of all our crawfish boils. Um, so tuna packets, salmon packets, tuna and water, salmon, all really great options, especially for people who might not be able to get fresh seafood um, all the time. Next is uh, oils and fats. Mediterranean diet, I think that's where it might differ from a lot of uh, what we teach here. Um, th their diets are t tend to be higher in fat, but better quality fats, specifically a lot of monounsaturated fat. But the goal in the Mediterranean diet is to have a, about, one, about one and a half times the amount of unsaturated fat to saturated fat. Precisely, it's going to be 1.6 times the amount of unsaturated to saturated. I do uh, encourage people to try to do those higher in monounsaturated fat rather than those processed oils that tend to be higher in omega-6. Um, so good options include 
Uh, obviously, olive oil, avocado oil is becoming more and more available. Sesame oil is really good. And for more uh, everyday cooking, I do recommend canola oil. It is a little high in mono and higher in monounsaturated fat. I do tell people to stay away from soybean oil, vegetable oil, corn oil, because they are, again, pretty high in omega-6 fatty acids. So we try not to use those when possible. Again, avocados can be an excellent choice. Even one avocado can have uh, 12 grams of fiber, which I don't think a lot of people recognize. So it's, avocados are, don't, don't only taste great, but they're really uh, good for us in a lot of ways. So again, we don't limit fat. Uh, it's just about the quality of fat that we focus on in the Mediterranean diet. Uh, dairy is another point that might be a little bit different than what we teach here in America. Um, this is a, one of the two points of Mediterranean diet score that are less than. So the goal is to have less than about uh, seven, to eight, seven or so ounces per day. Um, and more in the forms of fermented dairy and aged dairy, things like cheese and cheese and yogurt. So Mediterranean countries, like a lot of the rest of the world, don't really drink milk as a beverage. Uh, and we know there, there might actually be some uh, great properties from the fermenting and aging process. I'm sure we're learning more and more about things such as the microbiome. Um, so we encourage people a little less. Additionally, those fermented and aged products are going to be less uh, lower in lactose. So as you know, a lot of our, as you probably know, a lot of our popu population is lactose intolerant. So this is a nice way to incorporate dairy into um, the diets of people who otherwise might not be able to have it. Uh, we actually show things like yogurt, um, plain yogurt used in more savory applications and encourage people to get plain yogurt so they can add their own sweetener because uh, flavored yogurts tend to be so high in sugar and even artificial sweeteners. And we also show people how to use it in things like, you know, to make a creamier soup or sauce uh, and maybe use it on something like a taco in exchange for sour cream. I did, and there is actually a lot of interesting new uh, research coming out about low-fat versus high-fat dairy. Uh, still inconclusive, but, you know, low-fat dairy may not be as important as we used to think. We actually recommend some fat in it anyway, um, and we're, we're really paying close attention to the to new research that's coming out. But to me, uh, fat is satiating, and it also just makes a better tasting product. I think we need to get away from the low fat craze. So I actually do recommend at least some fat in things like yogurt um, when we're doing it. Next is meats. Uh, you can actually include meat in Mediterranean diet, as I mentioned before. This is another one of the less than, though. It's less than about three to four ounces per day or the size of the palm of your hand or a deck of playing cards. Um, you know, a lot of our patients eat a lot more, maybe two, three times the amount of meat they really should in a day. Uh, so I try to encourage people to stay away from meat at breakfast. That tends to be our very highly processed meat that we know can be carcinogenic anyway. Um, and instead, maybe eat it at breakfast or lunch and or dinner, and when they do it, uh, find ways to incorporate less. Now, I find an easy way to do that is with one-pot meals. So things like casseroles, pasta, soup, stews, you know, rice dishes, where we can cut out half the meat, add more vegetables, and maybe even some legumes, and people don't even notice it. Whereas if I were to give you a half a chicken breast and, and put it on your plate, uh, you might look at me like I was crazy. So I try to find almost sneaky ways to do it that people don't notice. And I do tell, you know, show people also that by eating less meat, they are going to lower their food costs. The meats and those animal proteins do tend to be the most expensive part of our plate. It's not realistic of me to assume that a lot of our patients are going to stop eating meat. Um, you know, it's really ingrained in their culture and society of a lot of people. Uh, so I do want to meet them where they're at, but again, just find ways to cut it down and open up um, the, their perspective on ways to incorporate more vegetables and less meat into their diet. In our first class, we always do spaghetti, where we show four different versions. Our first is a traditional spaghetti, um, and then our fourth is actually totally vegetarian. So our first version starts traditional. Second version, we cut out half of our um, meat and switch to Chop, we had chopped up mushrooms and veggies to replace it, also to add some umami back to the dish. Uh, and then we use whole wheat pasta and other flavor builders um, instead of cutting out uh, and cut down a little bit on the salt. 
In our third version, we actually incorporate lentils into it. So we have a little meat, a little lentil, and a little uh, some vegetables in our sauce. And in the fourth version, we do a completely lentil and veggie-based sauce. And, and this is a really interesting kind of experiment to show people how easy it is to make um, little changes. So uh, a lot of our patients might just go from number one to number two, where they're adding more vegetables and less meat. But that's great. We cut out half the saturated fat. We added more fiber, where they're a whole grain pasta. Um, and sometimes they might eventually get to number four. Some people might say, ah, I really actually like these lentils. Um, and that's great. As long as we can get them to start to move in that direction, I, we, we think that's really wonderful. And we're starting to get into sort of that two-point improvement. Um, last but not least is alcohol. Uh, alcohol, as you might know if you've been to Mediterranean countries, they do uh, love their wine. They tend to love their wine quite a bit. But they tend to drink it more in moderation, you know, just a glass here and there. So it's a Mediterranean diet score. We do actually know that alcohol is good for us, but there's a small therapeutic window. It's about one in, to one and a half drinks per day for women and two to two and a half drinks per day for, for men. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can save up 14 drinks for a Saturday night. Clearly, binge drinking isn't good for us. Um, and this doesn't mean if someone drinks, they should start drinking by any means. We just want to help people to drink in moderation when they do. This doesn't necessarily have to be wine. Uh, really, the research has only shown that wine is, is only incrementally, red wine is only incrementally better than white wine, which is only incrementally better than spirits, which is only incrementally better than beer. So, I tell people, find what you enjoy and just have it in moderation. But I also tell people to um, make sure that they watch things like mixers, you know, and so juices and such that might add a lot of extra sugar and calories. Um, just to show you a little bit more of the research, uh, this is the Leon Heart Study, which was done in Leon, France, on 605 people who had a first heart attack. Um, and what they had done is put half of them on a Mediterranean diet and to told the other half to follow a more standard prudent diet. Uh, this was a very interesting study, I think, um, because of one, the significant difference we saw was all 50 to 70 percent reduction in a second heart attack event for the people that followed a Mediterranean diet. So 50 to 70 percent. It was actually such a marked uh, difference in the people following the med diet versus the prudent diet that they uh, actually cut the study short uh, because they didn't think it was ethical to continue it any longer. That's how, how different the results were and how uh, marked the results were in the study. Um, so I think this is a really good example of how the med diet might help. Now, <laughs> I find this very interesting because when people have a heart attack, I, I've, been, I've seen it. They, ne they barely ever get counseled on diet. They get put on some medication. They get a stent, whatever might happen. They get sent home. Um, and a lot of times they end up back in the hospital because they aren't changing anything about their lifestyle. So this needs to be part of the conversation to incorporate healthy changes. Um, last but not least, I'm going to show, actually I think I have one more, I'm sorry. Um, this is uh, 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 diabetes. Last but not least, this is a study done on the AARP. And um, hopefully, I've disabused you at this point of any ideas that the Mediterranean diet is about Mediterranean recipes. It's really just about ingredients. And it can be uh, used in any type of diet or any way of eating that people enjoy. Um, we can use Mediterranean diet principles and uh, Latino food, we can use it um, in the American diet. And this is actually a good example of using it in the American diet. So these were 380,000 people in the AARP here in America. 
over five years, and they basically appointed their diets to the Mediterranean diet score. And what they found were that those with the higher Mediterranean diet score, so the seven and nine, were 23 percent less likely to die from any call, any cause at all. Uh, women saw a reduce um, in death from cancer, and uh, again, just one point increase meant an additional 5% reduction in risk of death from all causes. So if we can get our patients to just improve one point in the Mediterranean diet score, they can have a 5% reduction uh, in risk of death from any cause, which I believe, again, is pretty powerful. So um, from all this, Hopefully, two small changes, helping to move our patients two points, um, can help us kind of uh, take this, put this into perspective, realistic approaches they can take. Can we get them to move toward more whole grains? Can we get them to incorporate more fruits? Can we get them to cut down on the amounts of meat that they're eating in diet? Whatever ways you think might be practical for your patients, that's a really good way to start. Um, so the... As people ask me, he uses culinary medicine, and the answer is really everyone. Uh, we see it across the healthcare team, so physicians, residents, medical students, nurses, doc, uh, dietitians, pharmacists. Uh, we teach dietetic interns. Um, we are teaching culinary professionals. I actually think this is extremely relevant for the culinary profession as well, and something uh, I'm also um, very excited about delving more and more into teaching health professionals how to tie this, these culinary medicine principles into their practices, especially when we think of institutional food service, things like schools and hospitals. Uh, I'm sure we all know that food is not very healthy, but a lot of the reason why is because traditionally chefs are not taught a lot of nutrition practices, or they're taught on paper and they're not taught in practical aspects. So, and and they're, they don't really understand what nutrition means, what it means to eat healthy, or they have outdated views of it. Uh, so I really like showing chefs that, you know, nutrition is not what we think of uh, from when we went to school and, and had over-steamed broccoli that's not seasoned. Uh, there's a lot of great ways to um, incorporate healthier eating and ways that people are really, really going to enjoy. And fortunately, fits into a lot of the trends like uh, more local and sustainable foods. We can really incorporate it into that. So, um, you know, we can teach these principles to everyone, practical applications, how to use food really as medicine. I mentioned this earlier about how uh, bringing these culinary medicine principles into um, the practice can, it can really strengthen the relationship. I think it helps doctors to really understand the role of a dietitian, understand how how having a dietitian can help strengthen their practice. They are much more likely to refer to a dietitian. I'm saying this anecdotally, but from our experience, because they recognize that they don't have the time in the clinic with the patients to really delve into dietary habits like a dietitian does. Um, so I've, a lot of physicians that have taken our programming have not only started building kitchens in their clinic, but they're hiring dietitians to be on staff so that they can incorporate visits uh, at it much more easily um, than sending them to a dietitian. I'm sure you all know it's much more easier to reimburse when a dietitian piggybacks off of the physician rather than uh, having to go bill from somewhere else. So it really also gets them to talk the same language that we're speaking. I'm sure we've all been frustrated at times that doctors giving misinformation to patients about what a healthy diet is. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not blaming them. They, they do their best based on off what they've been given. Uh, they haven't been given a lot in, historically in terms of nutrition education, which I'm going to uh, touch on right here. So they're recommended to give 25 hours of nutrition education in medical school. But when this survey was taken um, in 2015, only 29% of medical schools in the U.S. were actually meeting that standard. On average, medical students were only getting about 14 hours of nutrition education. And what they were getting really wasn't at all about food. It was strictly you know, the biochemical, physiological process of food and nutrition. Uh, so as a result, they really don't feel adequately trained to talk about nutrition. So that's why the conversation isn't happening. Uh, in this study, only 14% of the uh, physicians that were asked felt confident in actually talking to their patients about nutrition. We're trying to change that uh, by actually incorporating culinary medicine uh, classes into the medical student curriculum. 
We started this out as an elective, but now it's grown to a requirement for the medical students. They have a lot of different options to get involved with us. So um, every student at uh, Tulane, actually this needs to be updated, it says three modules incorporated. Now this year it's four modules that the medical students take with us. And in these modules they are doing, um, they're cooking the food, but they're also getting the case studies like the one I showed you sooner that really integrate how, that show them how to integrate this information into their practice. So yes, they're learning about these culinary and nutrition principles, but how do they actually use that to speak to their, to their patients in a way that their patients will understand? So we want them um, to, take, to, to have some takeaways from this in the long run and how to actually utilize it. So we do that through case-based learning. And then, of course, they get the nutrition information through online lectures. We do an inverted classroom, so they watch the lectures before they come, and then they get really get the practical application once they come to class. They can take that a step further and do an eight-class elective, and they can take that even further during their fourth year um, and rotate for a full month with us. We host both medical students from Tulane and uh, medical students from visiting medical schools all around the U.S. I'll mention while I'm talking about this, that we do also host dietetic interns. They get right now two classes. We're looking to incorporate that every year. They also do a two-week rotation with us. Uh, I do both two-lane um, uh, dietetic interns, and a lot of visiting dietetic interns will also come as if they're, if they're part of a program that, that allows that. Um, additionally, the medical students help teach our community classes, which which I'm about to talk about a little more. And they can also do research rotations. And our fourth year medical students also have a really fun option of going to Johnson & Wells, my alma mater, uh, to do culinary school and culinary nutrition during their fourth year. Uh, we do license to other medical schools. As I mentioned earlier, over 20% of the medical schools in the US have licensed our programming. Some are starting to incorporate into with their programming for their dietetic interns. They utilize our community programming as well. Um, these are some of the schools that we have. There are a few I have an update on this list because it's constantly getting updated all the time. But I think right now we're in over 50 programs. That includes residencies, medical schools, and medical facilities around the U.S. So uh, you might not, um, you might be in an area that actually has some culinary medicine already going on. And if you're curious about that, you can always reach out to me. Uh, this is our last, this is actually going to be a poll for this case study, just to show you another example of what the medical students are, are learning. Uh, this is, um, again, I'm only showing you one question from this. We actually do incorporate other questions that incorporates it into their learning to prepare for their step exam. Um, but this is about Mr. H. He's a 48-year-old African-American. Uh, you'll see a lot of African-American males, because it is actually a large part of, our pop, part of our population here in New Orleans, uh, who comes um, for a primary visit. He's with his wife, which is really great. He does have a five-year history of hypertension, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia. He also has hep C um, and is on a trial for that. Um, he really doesn't like the idea of being all his, on his, all his medications, and he, he came with his wife to the visit to really just talk about how his lifestyle might be improved, so maybe he could get off some of his medications. Um, he's a contractor. He doesn't smoke. He's not drinking because of his hepatitis protocol. He says he had a physical job as a building maintenance supervisor. Um, he eats on the run, so typically in a day, he'll stop at McDonald's for an egg McMuffin and a coffee. He'll stop in the cafeteria for lunch, but usually he has a Subway turkey sub. He thinks they can a healthier choice by doing that. He'll snack in between lunch and when he goes home for dinner, uh, usually vending machine like peanut butter crackers. And usually his wife cooks for dinner, which is great, and she's there with him. She'll do it half the time from scratch and half the time what I call more like speed scratch, something like hamburger helper, convenience foods uh, to make it a little easier on her. His um, diabetes looks pretty good. He's at 6.3. That's pretty well controlled. Uh, his cholesterol and um, lipids are, are okay. They're definitely not terrible. His blood pressure is a little high, so I might start focusing because he, you can look at his diet. He's probably has a, he has a high sodium diet, so we'd like to, to focus a little bit on sodium reduction with him. And uh, this is where I think our poll question is going to pop up for you all. So if you want to take a minute to answer that, how many milligrams of sodium do you think that Mr. H's breakfast has? Give you a second to, uh, to answer that. Cool. 
All right, I think we're, we're looking pretty good. Y'all are smart. Yeah. <laughs> we all know how much extra sodium there is in our diet. So, um, yeah, the answer was uh, D. Let's see if we can move forward here. I think we're getting out of there. Uh, uh, 1,170 milligrams. Um, and that is, just so you know what that includes, that includes a sausage egg McMuffin with a coffee and hash browns because let's be realistic, he's probably getting the meal. A lot of our med students will just see what's in an egg McMuffin and assume he's just getting that, but realistically we know that's probably not the case. Sometimes people may even get two sausage egg McMuffins, uh, not, not tell us, so we may have to pry uh, a little bit for, um, for answers there. So I guess what I'm getting what I'm trying to say from this, what I talk to our medical students about is, I think sometimes patients don't always, they don't always necessarily withhold information on purpose. They may not provide the full story. So we do need, do need to get them to ask for, you know, more specifics. I've actually had patients who said they had, they made themselves an egg sandwich for breakfast at home. And realistically, when I asked some more questions, I found out they were getting a, a sausage and McMuffin from McDonald's, which is a different story. So uh, we need to continue to ask those questions. I do see an, a question here um, about uh, do we assess using BMI? Yes, we actually do use BMI assessments. We do actually have the medical students assess that. We talk about BMI. Would you talk to me about the importance of uh, utilizing the waist to hip ratio that might be more telling of, um, of their overall health. And we also talk about how hard weight loss is. It's an area we were getting more and more into and how people can still really improve health outcomes even if they're not able to lose much weight. Uh, but there are more and more interesting, that's actually a whole other conversation that we're working on uh, with an obesity collaborative we're working on. But um, I think it's important not to just focus on weight, to really focus on the quality of the foods that people are eating. So um, some questions we might ask the medical students and that you all might think about are to recommend, recommend ideas for him or make substitutions um, based on Mediterranean diet guidelines. Uh, uh, for him, we want to think about what his barriers are. I might say um, it seems like he's eating on the go. Um, and what are his preferences? Well, when we look at his diet, we can actually see He's a pretty salty snacker. He doesn't eat a lot of sweet foods, right? He's eating McDonald's for breakfast, turkey for lunch, peanut butter crackers for a snack, things like hamburger helper. So, you know, when we really get the sodium content on his whole meal for the day, it, it gets to be fairly high, which is not uncommon. Um, so I might, you know, his wife is there. She's obviously invested and wants to help. I think talking with her about dinner uh, might be, a really easy way to start. Uh, teaching her how to read labels is something really simple we can do. You know, when you look at the label for something like Hamburger Helper, serving size somewhere around a cup. Now, I grew up eating Hamburger Helper. I'm from Southwest Ohio. We ate a lot of it. <laughs> I can tell you I didn't eat a cup. No one did. I think the box is supposed to serve about five people. Uh, realistically, I know people who split a, split a box just between two of them. So I do talk about, you know, what is a serving size versus what are you actually eating? And then how can we look at that sodium uh, on the label to make better choices? So I might pull for her a healthy hamburger helper recipes off the internet. There are thousands and thousands if you just Google it really fast and print it out for her. Um, and talk about ways to lower the sodium by looking at labels and relying a little less on processed foods. And I might also focus on saving money um, in that way. So. Uh, I might focus, start with his dinner, and I might focus on things, even that Subway, which seems pretty healthy on the surface when we really delve into the sodium content, especially knowing he's probably getting a foot long and maybe even a side of chips. Uh, the sodium, again, really starts to go up there, but I, I might talk about packing lunch, might talk about bringing leftovers, just getting a little um, cooler bag to carry with him if he's on the go, uh, and really, I think, involving his wife is going to be key here. Um, next, we do community education. We do free community cooking classes, which is one of my favorite parts about what we do. We have an adult classes, family classes, kids classes, senior classes, and we do a kids camp um, as well. 
Uh, we do those uh, about five days a week. Our medical students help to teach those classes. Uh, but those are completely free and open to the public. So we do get more and more doctor referrals, and we also send them from, we do have a dietitian on site who sees patients, uh, and she'll often get her patients into our cooking classes as well. Uh, we do work with culinary schools. We host interns from various culinary schools, largely Johnson & Wells, but we started expanding to places like uh, the Culinary Institute of America, Delgado here in New Orleans, uh, the Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College. Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College in Northwest Arkansas have actually partnered with medical programs, largely the nursing programs, to offer culinary medicine classes to, uh, to their students at the community colleges. So those are actually really great opportunities to integrate those programs because a lot of times community colleges that have, uh, might have a culinary program and they already have kitchens, which is often one of the biggest barriers that people have. We do offer professional programming. I, I don't have this in here, but uh, you can do get uh, continuing education credits with us by coming to take hands-on classes. If you want to take it a step further, I don't think I have a slide on this. Uh, yes, I do have a slide on this. If you want to take it a step further, um, you can do our certification program, become a certified culinary medicine specialist. If you want more information on that, you can go to healthmeetsfood.com. Again, that's healthmeetsfood.com for the certification. We also offer an annual conference. We're planning in right now for our June conference. Everyone gets hands-on cooking classes, lectures, uh, 15 to 20 uh, credit hours. Um, again, so again, you can do continuing medical education throughout the year with us at the Goldring Center. We have uh, CME weekends or CEU weekends. Uh, and then we also have our, um, our conference in June. We do uh, perform some research around uh, what we're doing as well. Without the outcomes, we know that this program isn't going to be sustainable. Now, pie in the sky, we're going to prove that we have healthier patients, and we hope that insurance companies down the road are going to reimburse us for people coming through our cooking classes, because we know, even though they're free, they're not actually free. We have to find ways to pay for them. Um, so research is a really important part of what we're doing. Um, these are medical student outcomes. We've been doing this now. I've been with the, the program since its inception and built it from scratch. We really didn't know what we were doing. We're just kind of making it up as we're going, you know, taking our best guess and then getting a lot of feedback and reworking our curriculum. So the first year we did our curriculum, we, uh, we assessed the whole medical student class, whether or not they were doing our elective, and um, compared them. And what we were trying, we, we measured them in these 25 core outcomes involving their personal dietary habits, their attitudes on nutrition, um, and, and their knowledge on nutrition and food and their comfort in talking to patients about it. So that for those things that you see in yellow, we may have moved the needle on, but not enough to be statistically significant. Those green, we were statistically significant. And the red, we actually didn't move the needle at all. So after year one, you can see we were a little disappointed. And we came back to the drawing board and really took our feedback seriously and totally reworked our curriculum. And at the end of year two, you can see we made some pretty, pretty drastic um, improvements. By the end of year three, we made statistically significant improvements uh, in all 25 core competencies. More likely to understand the role of a glycemic index in load and dietary management. They're 21 more times likely to understand the role of the Mediterranean diet. 14%, 14 times more likely to understand um, the DASH diet. So uh, also, they're more likely to, uh, to eat more vegetables, eat more fruit, and to incorporate Mediterranean-style principles into their own diet. So we're really proud. Um, of these uh, outcomes and how we've improved them. Now you can see we have more that aren't statistically significant, but at the top you can see we've actually surveyed over 3,000 students in year five. And a lot of our partner schools are just starting their, pro their program, so there is a bit of a learning curve involved. This is a little bit on our community out um, outcomes. Again, uh, you can see at the beginning we didn't have great community outcomes, and then we came back and kind of reworked our curriculum and, and retried it, and, and a lot more of our outcomes were statistically significant. So we're pretty happy about this. Uh, we measure community members on their Mediterranean 
diet score, so you can see they're more likely to eat fruits and vegetables. Now, this is uh, self-reported, which, as you know, can be complicated. We have done some smaller research studies actually collecting receipts from family members to see if their shopping habits have improved uh, since taking our classes. And I just didn't have enough time to really go over all those. But they actually did improve their shopping habits um, as a result of coming to our cooking classes and improve their Mediterranean diet score um, at least. Um, so how do we take this all together and actually apply uh, these culinary medicine principles in your clinic or at home? So ideally, you have a kitchen and you could do cooking classes. Now, that might mean you partner with someone who has a kitchen. Uh, that might mean you, I will tell you, almost no one, including us, started with a built kitchen. I started with no kitchen. I was out in the community finding existing kitchens to do these classes. And almost all of our staff uh, and, and helpers were volunteers. For the first two and a half years, I was the only employee, so I was working pretty hard. Um, so you can do this on a much smaller scale and make it happen. But if, if you can't, there are ways you can do. You could do demos, although I do like the hands-on approach if it's an option. And tastings, I mentioned the whole wheat pasta, just something as simple as that. People can see that they enjoy it. But just incorporating these food first-based approaches and realistic approaches in the clinic is a really great way to do it. And, and getting our physician friends and our nurse friends and everyone um, in the healthcare team to be on the same page and doing some education with them so they understand the messages they should be giving patients um, as well. And uh, you may also want to partner, we'll look at some of your medical schools or maybe licensing opportunities with medical or nursing programs, uh, dietetics programs. Uh, you can also do some continuing education so that you learn culinary medicine practices uh, to better incorporate them into your practice. So um, well, you can walk away um, knowing that a culinary medicine can really help to improve patient health outcomes and your in interdiscipl it's interdisciplinary care within the health, health team. You really want to aim to improve your patient scores by just two points, which can reduce their all-cause mortality by 25%. And you really want to find a way to use culinary medicine that works for you in your practice but is applicable to your patients and not go over their head uh, in making recommendations. Um, that's all. I'm just going to put this slide up. Uh, you can find our website at culinarymedicine.org. We do have a lot of recipes and handouts you're welcome to use and disperse and share with your patients or yourself. Uh, we just, you just cannot alter those, but you can certainly print them from our website. Feel free. Um, we, you can also find more about our certification at healthmeetsfood.com. Feel free to email me with any questions, and you can follow us. We are pretty active on Facebook, especially if you want to learn more about our program and the initiatives uh, going on around the U.S. And thank you all so much for your time. Um, if there's a moment, I can stay on for a few more questions, but I'm actually going to pass it back to Robin. Thank you, Leah. That was wonderful. I learned so much, and uh, it's amazing what you're doing out in the community. And thank you for our participants for all your great comments and questions. Um, for, if you would like to join, get more information about Military Families Nutrition and Wellness Concentration Area, please go to our Facebook page, Twitter, listen to our nutrition and wellness audio interviews, or, or uh, go on to our website at militaryfamilieslearningnetwork.org and what you've all been waiting for. In order to receive your uh, continuing education credits, please click on, on the evaluation at this Qualtrics link. You will uh, fill out a completed evaluation and fill in your email, and they will send you your uh, CDU certificate. And this will also be posted on the event page. And Military Families Learning Network, Nutrition and Wellness are very happy to present the ketogenic diet, our upcoming webinar, the ketogenic diet, is it another fad, February 26th, and this is supposed to be at 11 a.m. Eastern time, not at 1 a.m. Eastern time. Um, all you to RSVP, please go to this link. And just one more thing, we are starting an email list. So if you would like to uh, receive emails directly about your, uh, about nutrition and wellness upcoming events, please either type your email into this chat pod 
or we're also going to post a link that you can click on and you can sign up for our email list there. And now I'm going to turn it over to Coral. Thank you. Robin, thank you. I just want to echo Robin's sentiment. Thank you, Leah, so much for sharing your expertise and experience and all of the wonderful things that y'all are doing in your community and at Tulane. I uh, also want to say thank you again to everyone who participated in our discussion today. Thank you for uh, imparting your questions and your knowledge as well. Uh, it was so nice to have all of you. As Robin mentioned, we have a host of resources available to you. Uh, if you would like to head on over, you can learn more about the MFLN and the Nutrition and Wellness Concentration Area at MilitaryFamiliesLearningNetwork.org. I would also like to let you know that the Nutrition Wellness team has been quite active for some time. So if you're interested in obtaining CE credit, uh, do go check out uh, their page on the MFLN website and you can find a whole host of archived webinars that are still available and eligible for CE credit. So we'll stick on for just a couple more minutes in case you have any uh, wrap-up questions for Leah. Otherwise, we do invite you to follow up with her directly, at, and we'll flip it back to her contact information here in just a moment. Thanks again for joining us, and we wish you a wonderful rest of your day. All right, thank you again. We are going to close out the webinar room for today. We appreciate your attendance. Leah, thank you again, and thank you again to also the Nutrition Wellness Team for hosting today's session. Have a wonderful day, and we will see you again soon.